Uh, hi, guys. Thanks for coming. This is a supplementary tutorial. Uh, we're giving it outside of regular tutorial hours, but honestly, I think of all the tutorials that we're going to give in the term, this is probably the most, most important, most valuable. Uh, definitely, we're covering one of my favorite tools, and I think probably one of the tools that's going to save you the most time in the long run in this course and in pretty much any other course that you're going to use C++ in. Um, yes, if you guys remember from this past Wednesday's tutorial, we talked a bit about Valgrind, which was a super handy tool for debugging. It allows you to easily find uh, memory errors in your code. So if you have memory leaks, if you have bad memory accesses, if you don't match your news with your deletes, uh, Valgrind will let you know, but really any error outside of memory leaks and, and memory kinds of errors, Valgrind isn't going to catch. So we need more tools. We need something else to be able to help us find uh, and identify and kind of deal with those other kinds of bugs because, as we all know, bugs can come in all shapes and forms and a lot of them can be really hard to find. So today we're going to be talking about a tool that we have access to in the student environment called, uh, I mean, it says there GDB. GDB is the GNU Project Debugger. Project Debugger. And what GDB allows us to do is take our programs that we've compiled and kind of take them apart. So we can run through them, but we can also stop in the middle of execution. We can step through our code one line at a time. We can look at variables. We can look at the stack. It's honestly a really, really powerful tool that allows us to kind of take apart our programs um, without having to necessarily kind of parse through the source code. Sometimes it's hard to read. Sometimes it's hard to follow. We make mistakes. But GDB lets us really hone in on those details. Um, there are times when GDB is kind of overkill. Uh, most of you guys are probably familiar with uh, caveman debugging or, or printf debugging, where you throw printf statements throughout all your code, and then you use that to find when, uh, when your code breaks. And there are times when, honestly, that's the easiest solution. Just throw a printf statement in there, and that will help you kind of figure out what's going on. But for anything more than kind of the smallest bugs, uh, I don't know, I say that Printf debugging is sort of like a spoon, and GDB is like a full set of surgical tools. And today, we're going to be spending an hour talking about those tools and maybe, maybe scratching just the surface and giving you just what you need to be able to kind of go through this course and find your bugs. But if you guys do want to kind of delve more into this, GDB is an extremely powerful tool, and there are tons of resources online to kind of take a look at what it has to offer. So. To begin, uh, when we have a program, let's say I have my example program here called basic1.cc. Super simple program, uh, main function. We're assigning some values to some integers. Uh, we're adding one to another, and then we're making k equal to j times 2, and then we're printing out hello there. Uh, super simple program. And when we compile this code, when I say g++, basic1.cc, that's going to produce a dot, uh, uh, dot out, a dot out executable file. And what happens during that process, when I run that g++ command, is g++ takes my source code, mixes it all around, optimizes it, runs a bunch of optimizations that make your code faster. It can unravel loops. Uh, it can pre-evaluate some expressions. Um, it can eliminate dead code that we can't reach. Um, but the issue there is that it jumbles up our code. So we can't really look inside of our executable files and kind of piece together what's going on. So as some of you might remember from our Valgrind tutorial, there is a compiler flag that we can use to tell the compiler not only to leave our code intact, so don't run any optimizations, like leave for li line for line exactly what my source code says to do, and also to package in with our compiled code a copy of the original source file so that we can actually look inside and go line by line and see what exactly it's doing. Uh, so this flag is the dash g flag. 
Uh, I'm also going to tell it to use uh, C++14 and compile basic1.cc and let's, gonna, let's put it in our basic1 file. So we compile fine. It looks the same, but now that we have used our dash g file, uh, our dash g flag and incorporated all of that information into our executable file, GDB can now extract that information and take a look at it and let us kind of play around with our code and see what's going on. So just keep that in mind. When you want to use GDB, use the dash g compiler flag. Now, I've been talking a lot about GDB in, in, in principle. Let's take a look at how it works in practice. So to run a program inside of GDB, you type GDB and then the name of the program. So in this case, basic one. So I run this and then we get a whole bunch of license agreement sort of stuff. And then at the bottom, we have a small prompt, GDB, and I can type whatever commands I want in there and GDB will run them. So to start out, if I want to debug my program, uh, let's start out by trying to run our program. So GDB has its own set of commands, just like bash has a full set of commands that do a bunch of cool stuff. GDB has its set of commands that each does a different thing that helps us debug our code. So the first command that we're going to be talking about today, and I'll actually add them to the board as we go. Um, yeah, I'll just add them here. We have the run command. And the run command, surprisingly enough, runs our program. So when I type run into GDB and hit enter, it will output right here, starting program, and then it tells you what the executable file is, the path to the file. Here's our output, hello there. And then we exit our program normally, and then we get our GDB prompt telling us, okay, what do you want me to do next? This is cool, we can run a program inside GDB, but it's not any different from what we were already able to do. We could already run a program. Let's take advantage of one of the tools that GDB has to offer called breakpoints, which some of you might be familiar with if you've programmed in an IDE before. Um, let's tell GDB to, instead of running through our entire program, to stop at a certain point. In order to tell it where to stop, we can give GDB a breakpoint. And all that is is just a specific line of code where when we, our program reaches that line, we stop executing. We stop at that point, we wait, and then we can give GDB more commands. In order to create a breakpoint, we use the break command. Break. And we can set a breakpoint at a specific line. So I could say break uh, seven, and that will set a breakpoint at line seven. Our program will stop at line seven. We can also give GDB a function name. So in this case, I'm gonna say break main and we have now created a breakpoint at our main function in our program. So our output, our uh, output from GDB, it says breakpoint one at this memory address uh, in file basic1.cc at line four. So now when we run our program, I type run, hit enter, we start our program, but then instead of running the whole program and getting our output, we see this breakpoint one main function at this line in this file, and then our line four of our program. So what's happened here is we've run our code up to that point and then we've stopped and GDB says, okay, cool. Let's stop at the beginning of the main function and now tell me what to do. So this is super handy because now we've stopped our program before it completes and we can kind of take a look at kind of the state of our program at different points in the code. So, uh, just one quick side note, by the way. Uh, when we run our program with run, this run command works just like uh, the command name in bash. So if I want to give it arguments, I can say arg1, arg2, these are my arguments. I can do input redirection. I can say, uh, here's my in file, dot in. So in GDB, if you want to run your program uh, just as you would another program with arguments and input, uh, you do so with the run command like we're doing here. Now, we've stopped at line four of our program. I want to tell GDB to 
Instead of keep running my program, let's just take one step forward in our program. Let's just say, okay, run this one line and then stop again. In order to do that, we have the next command. N-E-X-T, next. And that tells GDB, run the program and stop at the next line. So I type next into my prompt, hit enter, and we're now at our next line of our, our, of our program. Uh, line five, and it's just an assignment of the number seven to the integer k. Now, there are points when we're stepping through our code where we might get lost. All I can see here is just the name of this single line. So if you guys are ever stepping through your code and you wanna say, wait a minute, let's just take a look at the context. Where actually am I? The list command, here, I'll add it here. L-I-S-T, list. If I type list and hit enter, it will print out the lines of code around where I currently am. So we were at line five. Here's line five in the program, and then we get a few lines before and a few lines after. So that can come in handy if you ever wanna know where you are in your program. So now we're at line five, and just, uh, just so you know, the line that uh, GDB will print out is the next line to execute. So right now it's telling us line five int k equals seven. This means that, ne that when I type next, that is the command that is going to be run. So at this point, our j has been assigned uh, and our k is about to be assigned. Now, if this were a more complicated program doing more complicated things, I might want to make sure that at this point in the program, the value of j is, is what I want it to be. It, looking, at this, looking at this source code, the value of j at this point should be three. Now, I can tell GDB, hey, please let me know what the value of this variable is. And in order to tell GDB to print out the value stored at some variable, we can use the print command, P-R-I-N-T, print. And what print will do is print out the value of a variable that we give it. So if I say print j, it will give us three, which is good because we've just assigned the value of three to j. Now, let's take a few more steps forward in our program. So I'm gonna write next again, and we now have our line, uh, line seven, j uh, plus equals k, so we're adding k to j, and then let's Go to the next line. Um, and before we continue, uh, all of these commands have shorthands. So I might accidentally use some of the shorthands while we're using the tutorial. Um, one of them, which is just handy to know, is you can, instead of typing next, just type the letter N, and that has the same effect. So I type N, and then we move on to the next line of our program. Now, one more note about the, um, about the print command is that it is Pretty smart. Uh, this is kind of one of GDB's real strengths. The print command not only can access the value of a variable and print it out, it actually understands C and C++ style syntax in terms of evaluating expressions. So at this point in our program, uh, we have, we can print out, so P is, P is also a way of printing P and J, let's print J, so the value of J is 10. I could also say print J plus k, and that will evaluate the expression that we give it, and then print out the result. And this can be as complicated as you want. You can say uh, j times three plus k uh, times two uh, minus two, and it'll evaluate the expressions we give it. Uh, the pointer dereferencing uh, operator also works here, so if we have a pointer and we wanna see what value is stored at that address, I could say print, uh, dereference my pointer pointer, and that will give me the value there. So the print command is really, really handy. It's one of the ones uh, we'll use most often when we're using GDB, uh, just to make sure that either as a sanity check to see what our variables uh, have assigned to them, or just to, to really see kind of what the flow of our program is actually doing to the values that we're storing. And that's it for this specific example. Are there any questions before I move on? Yes.
Uh, we'll take a look at that later. So we will get to that point. We're asking about function calls. Um, we will get to that later, but good question. So let's move on to another example. Uh, and it looks like I'm sort of stuck in GDB. I can't really sort of say uh, colon Q because this, is, this isn't Vim. But luckily, we have the quit command, Q-U-I-T, quit. And that allows us to leave our current instance of GDB. Uh, if we're still running the program, it will ask us to confirm. We can say yes, and we're back where we started. We're good to go. Now, let's take a look at a slightly more complicated program called example1.cc. So, in this program, we have three functions. Uh, at line three, we have our crash function, which basically just takes an integer pointer and assigns the value of one to, um, uh, to what it's pointing to. We have our function f right here, which has a few function calls in it, and then our main function, which uh, declares integer i and then calls function f on the address of i. Now let's run this program in GDB, example one. Now, actually before we run in GDB, let's just try running the program on its own. Example one. I hit enter, segmentation fault. Everyone's least favorite thing to see when they're writing C++ programs. What's so annoying about this is that this error message is as uninformative as it gets. All I know is that there has been a seg fault somewhere in my program and it's up to me to find it. This is where GDB comes in real handy. We can open GDB with our source, or our executable file, and let's, let's take a look. I'll give you a spoiler that the uh, seg fault happens in our function crash, which is uh, a very descriptive function name as it points us in the right direction. Let's break. So let's set a breakpoint at our function crash. So there's our breakpoint. And then let's run our program. So, what's handy about uh, our output here is that when we stop at our breakpoint, GDB will tell us not only the line that we're currently on, but it will tell us here that we are in function crash that was called with this value. We can see the parameters that were passed to our function. And as we can see here, the value that was passed to i in this function was null pointer. So, we know that the problem with our code happened sometime before crash was called. Now, this is a pretty simple program, but in larger programs where a function might be called at various points in our code, we might want a way to kind of pinpoint where exactly this function call happened. What, what led up to this point? How can we isolate the specific function call that led to our bug? And at this point, I mean, if I hit next, this is gonna, this is gonna complain, it's gonna seg fault because I would be trying to dereference a null pointer. I have my i as a null pointer and here I'm dereferencing it. So let's not do that. Let's not step forward on our code. Um, let's take a look at how we got here. And GDB, this is another one of its big strengths, give a, gives us the ability to navigate the call stack. Uh, not only does it let us kind of take a peek at, uh, at uh, the lower levels of the call stack, but we can also take an overview glance and um, mess around with what we have. So if I want to say to GDB, tell me what, what function called my function crash. Let's move up our stack frame, uh, let's move up our call stack and see what function call called our crash. And in order to do this, we have two new commands, up and down. And up and down allow us to peek up and down the call stack. So for example, if I type up here, then we move up the call stack to our function f in which the function crash was called. So we can move up and see that function crash was called at line 11 of our source code. We can see that function f uh, had this i passed to it. So 
we can see that i is not null pointer, which means that uh, at some point between when function f was called and when function crash was called inside of f, something happened to our pointer. Uh, I can also continue to move up. Uh, here I'm in my main function, and we can see that f was called on line 16 of our main function. And we can move back down with down to kind of go back down our call stack. Now, we have enough information here to see that something happened inside of our function f. So let's set a breakpoint at our function f, and let's run our program from the start again. So I'm going to type run. It's going to say the program being debugged has been started already. Let's say, nope, let's start it from the beginning. Yes. And now we have arrived at our call of function f. We can see that i is some valid pointer, and that j is a pointer that is being set to equal whatever i is. And now, let's keep track of what j is. Let's step through our code and keep track of what the value of our pointer j is before we get to our function crash. And this way, maybe we might be able to find out exactly where in our function f our pointer became a null pointer. Now, one thing I could do is just print out the value of j, but that becomes very tedious. If I want to step through a lot of lines of code, this will mean typing next, then typing print j, then typing next, then typing print j, and that's very tedious. I would rather just tell GDB, you know what? Every time I run a command, tell me the value of j. And this way, it just saves time for me, and it also allows me to easily keep track of what the value of j is throughout my program running. In order to do this, we have a new command. Display, D-I-S-P-L-A-Y, display. And display tells GDB, display the value j at every command we run. So I type display j. And this is going to print out, it seems like it's just printing out the value of j. But when I do next and move on to the next line of code, we can see that alongside the line of code that we're running next, it also prints out the current value of j. So we know that uh, after that line of code 8, right here, we assign the value of i to j, which is why in our, when we get to line 9, j is equal to what our initial value of i was. So let's take a few more steps through our code. Uh, we have in our source code, let's list it out first, list, list. So we can see here we assign i to j, and then j is set to equal the result of sophisticated j, and then complicated of j. Now these two functions are very sophisticated and very complicated, and also we don't have access to their source code. Uh, they have been compiled elsewhere and brought in for us, and we can't really take a look inside of them. So let's try stepping through our code. So we've just run our function sophisticated and assigned the return value to j. And we can see that at line 10, our j is still equal to what we want it to be. So let's try stepping forward in our code. And now we can see that after running our function complicated and assigning the return value to j, that j is now null pointer, which means that when we call our function crash, it's going to crash. Um, using display is very handy because it allows us to kind of keep track of stuff without always continuously printing. But if we're going through our code and then we say, okay, I've had enough of j, I don't want you to keep reminding me what the value is, I've seen what I need to see, there is the corresponding command to display, undisplay, which, funnily enough, tells GDB to stop displaying j. So when I say undisplay j, if I display number uh, at or near j, it will complain to me. Oh, and sorry, this is one thing with uh, undisplay. We do not tell it, we, when we say to display a variable, we give the variable name. 
when we say to undisplay, we can see at the front of every display line that there's a number here, number one. This is the ID of the display. So display, at, like, display of ID one is keeping track of J. I could make more displays. I could say display I, and you could see that this display has ID two. So when I want to say stop displaying, I just say undisplay and give it the ID number. So I say undisplay one, and then we're good to go. When I step through my code, it's going to crash. There we go. We're out. Oh, we're at our, our breakpoint crash. Um, and notice that now that we've left the scope of our uh, call function, we are not getting the display anymore. Oh, I think that's. That's it for that example. Oh, one last point and one last command that helps us kind of take a look at our call stack uh, that comes in very handy. Since up and down are kind of limited, like let's say I have some big program that has a ton of function calls. If I want to kind of trace back what function calls led me to this current line, I'm going to have to type up and then go up and up and up. And that's kind of annoying. That's kind of tedious. So I have a way of telling GDB, hey, instead of showing me one stack frame at a time, print out the entire call stack. And the command to do this is called backtrace. B-A-C-K-T-R-A-C-E, backtrace. And this will print backtrace. This will print the entire call stack, every single function, with all of the parameters passed to that function and the line in the code at which that function uh, is, like the, the line in the source code where we can find that function. So this can come in super handy when we're trying to kind of isolate parts of our code. Let's take a look at one more example where following the call stack can be kind of useful. As some of you might remember from CS135, uh, there are some programming problems where the code that's required to solve that problem is a lot shorter if we make use of a very special tool called recursion. I have fond memories of recursion. I assume all of you love recursion as well. Let's take a look at a program I wrote called Recursive. And Recursive solves a very common uh, example problem when we're talking about recursion. It calculates the factorial of some integer. So my program has a main function that asks, it prompts to input an integer. You can give it an integer. Uh, and if it's a positive integer, it will calculate the factorial and then print it out. And if it's not, then it'll complain. So if I try running my recursive program, let's give it a nice small one, four. And then it outputs that four factorial is 24. Now, in the case of recursion, we get a lot of function calls. And if you remember, the dash G flag, which we need to run GDB, tells it not to optimize. So a common optimization, which you might know about, called tail recursion, might kind of flatten out the call stack when we're using recursive functions. But that's not the case here, because we've told it not to optimize. So when I call recursive here, let's break at my function factorial, break a factorial, let's run the code, let's enter a positive integer, let's try four again, because we know that one works. And then we get to our function factorial, and we know that we've passed the value four to it. Now, at this point, I can step through my function factorial. We start with an if statement, if n, which is sort of the same as saying if n is not zero, so type next again, and then we reach our line where it tells it to return n times the factorial of n minus one, and this is how we recursively can define the factorial function. And you'll notice that there is a call to our factorial function, a recursive call right here. Now at this point in the code, we have a function call, but I don't want to step over that function call. I don't want to just kind of run that line of code and move on. I actually want to jump into the function call. I want to tell GDB, don't just skip over this line. 
go into my function factorial and let's walk through the lines of code inside the function. We have another GDB command that will do that for us called step, S-T-E-P, step. And step, unlike next, will actually go inside any functions that are listed inside of our, um, inside of our line of code there. So when I type step here, we now actually go into our factorial, and as you can see here, we are now in a call of factorial where n is equal to three. So this is our recursive call. If you remember, factorial before, we called factorial on four, and then internally, we recursively called factorial of n minus one, and here we are. Factorial of n minus one is factorial where n is equal to three. So I have my recursive call here, but it can get kind of long to do this sort of process with a recursive function. Especially if my function is quite long, I don't want to have to step through every single line of code in order to step in. In fact, if we look at my line of code here, I stepped into it, but it told, it told me, hey, just so you know, this is a breakpoint. This is breakpoint one at uh, this line. So let's see if we can make use of breakpoints again to stop us from having to step through every line of code. Let's just say GDB, keep running, and instead of going one line at a time, just run as many lines as you can until you reach the next breakpoint. So at the next call of factorial, it will stop at this breakpoint because it's a breakpoint, and we can kind of jump through our iterations of our recursive function more quickly that way. So in order to tell it to keep running code, and not stop one line at a time, uh, and to stop at a breakpoint, we have the command continue. Continue, C-O-N-T-I-N-U-E. And it's basically like calling run, except instead of starting from the beginning of the program, we start from wherever we currently are in our running program. So when I type continue, we can see that we've reached our breakpoint, at this, in this case, we had one breakpoint set to factorial, and as we can see, we are at the call of factorial where n is equal to two. So this comes in very handy if we want to set numerous breakpoints throughout our program and kind of jump around. We can set breakpoints wherever we need and then just kind of continue to jump to the next breakpoint that we've set. Now, let's keep going, let's continue. And we are at one, and let's continue one more time. So now we're at our base case. Now we're at our zero, which means that if we were to run through this, instead of trying to return n times factorial of n minus one, our program just returns one. Yes, I see a question. Um, when I type step, here. Um, so the reason step is different is that, okay, actually, yes, fair point. In this case, because we have a breakpoint, um, the next would have actually stopped at that breakpoint right there. But if we had not had a breakpoint inside of our function, then we would have just kind of skipped over that function call. So yes, actually, I can make an example of step later on where there isn't a breakpoint inside, but uh, that is a fair point. Because there's a breakpoint inside of a function, if we try to use next to step over that function, the breakpoint will actually stop inside of our function and stop us from continuing. Uh, so that's actually a fair point. So from this point, we're now at our base case. Uh, we're at zero, and instead of doing a recursive call, it'll return one. Now at this point, if I, if I continue to hit next, it will just reach the end, return, and then I'll hop all the way back up to my main function call. I don't really want to do that. I want GDB to show me what it does as it unravels the stack in this recursive call. So I want to tell GDB, run this function, run this current function call all the way to the end, and then when you pop this current stack frame, when you finish this current function, stop the code. This is just one of those other commands that allows you to kind of navigate through your code. The command is called finish, F-I-N-I-S-H, finish. 
And what finish allows us to do is tell GDB to finish this current function call and then stop once we've finished the call. So once we pop that stack frame for that function, stop there. And if we take a look, finish, if I run finish here, we will now pop out of our function call. It says run till exit from number zero. So this is stack frame zero, the top of the stack. Uh, factorial, and here's our function call. It then gives us uh, the function call that we've returned into, the line that we've returned into, and then, which is very handy, the value that our function returned. So let's say we're trying to step through our code and we're inside of a function and we don't really care about what the function's doing. We just, wanna, we just wanna see what the return value of the current function is. We just give it finish and then we jump to the end and see the return value. So let's run finish again. As we can see, it returns zero, it returns one again because we did one factorial times zero factorial. One times one is one. We can run finish again. We get two. We run it again, and as you can see, we're unraveling the stack. Our recursive calls of factorial are returning these values. And then we finish on our second to last uh, stack frame at our main function, where our call to factorial of n has returned 24, and as we know, that's the correct value. So that's kind of a handy use of our, of our uh, stack frame, or of our uh, ability to kind of navigate the stack frames. Um, let's actually try this one more time and just to show you one more thing which can be handy when we're doing recursive calls. If I want to, let's say, continue, 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 I am pretty deep in the stack. And let's say I have a big, very big program that has a big recursive function that recurses a bunch of times and I want to be able to trace down each of the parameters that was passed to my recursive function. Let's say it's not simple like this, where it just goes down by one each time. It could be something crazy. Who knows? We can use backtrace, which can be abbreviated to BT, and we can take a look at our stack right here, and we can see that our recursive function, uh, the first call was passed with the value four, the next with three, and the next with two, and we are currently at a call uh, where we pass the number one. So here's just another case where we can use backtrace to kind of find out where we are. Yes. Now, um, let's take a look at one more example where we have example two. And example two is a super long, super complicated file. It's not that long, but it's not very obvious what things are doing. These, file, these function names are not very descriptive. We have our function small, which divides an integer by 68. We have our bar, which multiplies it by three and then returns the value of some unknown function. Uh, we have our function oof, which does some math and then also subtracts the value of a function call. We have our function foo, which calls a bunch of things. It's all super complicated, um, lots of funky math. And at the end, we have our main function. And all this program does, all we want our program to do is to make sure that at the end of our run of the program, our variable x that we've declared and defined to be 10 in our main function, all that we want is for it to not be equal to zero at the end of the program. Now, as you might be able to predict, when we run our program, we get our error message, x is zero at the end of running the program. This is not what we want. So let's take a look at our program through the lens of GDB. Example two, and let's set a breakpoint at our main function, and let's run our program. So we stop at our main function, we hit next, you see n is gonna be set to 10. We get to our function call foo, and I can tell you in advance, foo is the problem. At some point, like if we check, if we print out the value of x, it's 10. So we know that sometime between setting it to 10 and checking the value, it gets set to zero, and foo is the only function there. So foo must be the problem. And as we know, foo calls a bunch of functions. It does a bunch of complicated stuff. It's really hard to follow. All I really care about in my program 
is when the value of x is changed. All I want to know is at what point x is going to become a different value, and specifically, when it's going to become 0. Now, GDB offers more than one way to tell our program when to stop. The first one, which we know about, is breakpoints. We can tell it, here's a line number and in a specific file, or here's a function name. Once you reach this point in the code, once you reach this line, stop here. But there's another way we can tell GDB when to stop, and that is with watch points. W-A-T-C-H, watch. And what the watch command does is well, it's pretty self-descriptive. We tell GDB, GDB, watch this variable. Don't take your eyes off of it. And if anything changes, let me know. So I'm going to tell GDB to watch my variable x. And it says that it set a hardware watch point at variable x, so it's going to be keeping its eye on that variable. And now let's run continue. Let's continue through our code. And then, lo and behold, our program has stopped at, let's see, line 11 of our example 2.cc two, um, example two file uh, in the function bar where we've passed the value 30. I don't even know how we got there. But we can see here that at this specific line in the program, at line 11, that the value of x has just changed. It's changed from 10 to 30. Now, this is super handy, as, as you can probably imagine. If we don't necessarily have a specific line in the code we want to stop to, but we just want to kind of keep track of a variable and know when it's being changed to something we don't want. I can keep continuing through my program. It's super complicated. The value of x changes a few times to a bunch of values until it changes to negative 1, and then it gets set to 0. And then we can continue through here, and then we reach the end of our program where we get our output right here, error x is set to 0. But through using watch points, we're able to determine that inside of our function foo, um, just before line 25, our value of x was set to 0. We can take a look. Uh, list. We can specify a line with list, or list, l for short. And we should probably start from there, list 25. If we take a look at line 25 here, the line before is where it was changed. And you can see here we've incremented um, the value of z, which happens to be a reference to our value x. Uh, so that's just kind of one case where watch points are super, super handy. And one more point on watch points. If we are debugging a really big program, and I know this has happened to me, where I'm going through my code, I'm trying to kind of narrow down where my error is occurring, and I'm setting a bunch of breakpoints. I'm setting a breakpoint at main. I'm setting it at like the function I think it's, that's the problem. I'm setting it at specific lines to kind of try and pinpoint where exactly the error is. The program is too big to just step through, so I'm just setting breakpoints. And when I find the error, I want to keep debugging my code. I want to keep stepping through. But I have all these breakpoints that are getting in the way. It's slowing me down. I'm trying to continue through my code, and it just keeps stopping me. Well, GDB understands that. It knows that even if you set a breakpoint at the beginning, you might not want it all the way through your debugging process. So it gives us not only a way to print out what, what breakpoints and watch points we currently have set, but also a way to remove them when we're done with them. So we have the command info, which is a very versatile command. Info, is, info has a lot of different uses. But we can type info breakpoints, points. And when we type that, uh, my watch point was deleted with the previous run, but let's just say watch x. Let's info breakpoints. And here we get as output a nice little table that gives us all the information we need. The ID number of the breakpoint or watch point, the type. So we have a breakpoint here. We have this one, which was already dealt with. We have our hardware watch point that we just set, and then a bunch of other details. And it tells you what it's following. Here, it's looking for this specific line, and our watch point is following variable x. Now that we know what we are actually following, what our watch points and breakpoints are keeping track of, we can tell GDB, I'm done with them. Let's get rid of them. And 
aptly named and very descriptive, that's a B, not a D. We can delete our breakpoints and watchpoints. D E L E T E, delete. Now, if I type delete, and if you remember from before, we don't give the name, we give the ID number. If I want to delete the watch point that I just made, like this specific watch point right here, I'm gonna type delete three, and it seems like nothing's happened, but when I check my breakpoints here, my breakpoint is gone. Don't need to worry about it anymore, or in this case, my watch point's gone, and I can keep going through my code without worrying about being stopped. If I want to keep going through my code and I say I'm done with all of my breakpoints and watchpoints, I just want to get, I want to clear the slate, start over again. Typing delete on its own without any uh, any variable, any any uh, parameters, will delete all of my breakpoints and watchpoints, and it will prompt. It will say, "Are you sure? Do you want to delete them all?" And I can say, "Yes, I hate this breakpoint. Time to die." And then we're free of that breakpoint. Um, small side note, info breakpoints is very long to type. I space B also works. And if we take a look now, info breakpoints tells us that there are no more breakpoints or watch points, which is nice because that's what we were trying to do. I have one last example. And let's just make sure we've gone through everything. There's one more, actually, there's one more command that is handy if we go back to our basic program, basic, and if you're trying to run a program, be sure to leave GDB before you try to run GDB. Basic one. So let's break at the main function and run our program. Let's step through. So we have our variables j and k. Not only can we print out the value of j, but we can say, what is j? Sometimes we have a bunch of complicated programs and we forget the type of what we're working with. This often happens if we're working on really, really big programs and you just see a variable name for like 50 lines of code and you forget what exactly is this. I can say, what is j? And it will tell me that the type of j is int. Uh, shorthand for what is is just what j. And then we also get that j is an integer. Now, those are, th this kind of list is pretty much it, this, should, this should suffice for the course of the term. You should be able to do all of your debugging with these commands. This is kind of the gist of what I had off the top of my head when I started working on this tutorial. But over the course of doing research for this tutorial, I happened upon a couple more really, really useful commands that I wish I would have known in CS246. So I'm gonna share them with you in the last couple minutes of this tutorial so that you guys are gonna become like super debuggers and will have a much easier time than I had when I was writing programs for this course. So I have a program here called example3.cc and example3, not super complicated. We have integer x which is set to 16. We run some mystery function on x and we give it one, who knows what it's gonna do. And then here all we say is x mod two, which means um, what's the remainder when we divide by two? In other words, if x is odd, run function fun. If x is even, in other words, x mod two is zero, run function funner. Now these functions, who knows what they do? If we try running our program, example three, we get CS136, CS136 a bunch of times, and then I can't wait for CS246. Now, let's debug, let's not really debug, this program is pretty cool already, but let's take a look at what's going on inside of our program and kind of see what these special commands are. So, let's set a breakpoint at main and run our program. So, we are here at our main function. Now, there are times that I've happened upon while debugging where I'm stepping through my program and I'm just rapidly hitting, hitting enter, just kind of stepping through, getting to the point I want, and I'm like, gosh, diggity darn it, I passed the line that I want to stop at, uh, all my variables are messed up now, what am I supposed to do? Well, 
GDB, a few years ago, implemented what I think is a very cool feature, which I call reverse debugging, which basically allows us not only to run our program as we've written it, but to start at a certain point in our program and run it in reverse. Step back one line at a time and undo commands that we've run. This comes in super handy, and I wish I had known this when I was taking 246. This functionality can probably obviously be finicky sometimes and might not always work. There are cases where the compiled code can't really figure out what the previous step was. And in the case of the student environment, on its own, we can't really extrapolate what old values of variables are just from the code itself. So in order to make use of this functionality, we need to tell GDB before we get started, like we've stopped at our breakpoint, at this point onwards, record everything that happens. Keep track of every change of every variable, every line that we run. So let's, we have our advanced functions here, our advanced commands. In order to tell GDB to record what happens, in order to kind of replay in reverse, we type target, T-A-R-G-E-T, -E target, record, sp so space, target, space, record, dash, full. And this tells it record everything from this point onward. So when I say target, record, full, Seems like nothing's happened, but let's step through our code. So we assign 16 to X, we run mystery, uh, we get here, and I'm like, wait a second. Let's take a look. Let's print out X right now. Okay, X is 17 right now. What was X before I ran mystery? Let's imagine there's a bunch of lines of code there. What was X before I ran mystery? Well, I just used the next command to jump to step through my code. Let's use reverse next. And look now, we are right before we called our mystery function. And if I print out the value of x now, it's back to being 16, just like it was before. Uh, reverse next is long to write, so we can just write rn, and that takes us back one more step. Um, there are also other commands, for example, reverse uh, step, which is rs, and reverse continue. So if you want and say, let's jump back to this point in the code, you can set a breakpoint before where you currently are and then just reverse back up to that point. Now, this is super handy, um, but there are times where it might not work just because it's, it's a finicky feature. But let's, let's try running our program once more. So now that we know that when the program is as it is currently, when x is set to 16 at the beginning, our program says 136, 136 a bunch of times. Honestly, I would rather it say 246. Let's change the behavior of our program. Now, normally, if I find a bug in my code and I want to change what my program does, I have to shut down GDB, go to my source code, change all my source code, recompile, reopen GDB, set all my breakpoints again, run through my code. It's a super long process. No one wants to do that. If you find a small thing in your code and you just want to say, hey, if I change this value, will the behavior change? Then GDB gives us a way, while running our program, to change the behavior. And one way in which it allows us to do that, let's say I'm running my program, and x here has been set to 16. And here I get to mystery, and I say, I know what this is going to do. It's going to set it to 17, which is odd. Let's change the value of x before we run mystery and see what happens. And the way we do this is with the command set. And similarly to info, set has a lot of uses. So we want to specify set var, so set space var, set variable. And then we could say x equals 15. Actually, let's erase that. That's not part of the command. But let's see what that actually does. If I say set var x equals to 15, and we print out the value of x. Remember, we just set x to 16. And I print out x, we get 15. Which means when I run my code, when I continue my code, we get this beautiful output, CS246. I love CS246. Thank you very much for coming to this tutorial. I hope you found it useful. And uh, good luck with the next assignment.